I'm grateful that we were able to study this morning on the generation that we're living in. It is very good news that we're here to share with you. It is not a message of, of fear, because in fear there is torment. And love cannot be perfected in fear. Every message that God has for us are messages of love, messages of mercy for especially those of us living in these last days. I, I want to continue to bring forth before us that we are really and truly living in the time of the end. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Just that name is very significant. You know, names are significant. They represent character. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall do what? Save his people from their sins. Not in their sins, but from their sins. Can you just imagine with me when Jesus was there in the Garden of Gethsemane? Just, if you just bring your mind back there. He's there in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying. And he's sweating blood. For you and for me. And for people that don't even care. He is feeling the pressure of your and my sins upon his holy head. He's seeing the horror of sin. Not just yours, not just mine, but everyone in this world. Including the people that died. Because there are more people dead than alive. He has all of our sins upon him at that point in time. What's the worst thing that you've ever done? Just, just one, not all of them. I don't mean to open up any old wounds. But just one of the worst things you've ever done. And how guilty did you feel? Take that guilt, just that one thing, and put it on Christ. The iniquity of us all was laid on him. Because his name is Jesus to save us from those sins. Not just all of our past sins, our present sins, as well as our future sins. If he didn't die for your future sins over 2,000 years ago, then when is he going to do it? When we sing that Jesus paid it all, he really did. But what are you going to do about it? Are you going to believe that? Are you going to live according to the fact that Jesus indeed paid it all? Are you going to live according to the fact that when Christ came here, he really took upon himself your humanity? Yours. It wasn't, it wasn't his. It was yours that he took on himself. That's why our high priest, he was touched in all points like as we are. Yes. Because he came in all points like as we are. And he brought something to that point where we were. Divinity. To bring us salvation. To bring a unity between humanity and divinity. That's what Jesus did. And he lived out the perfect version of your and my life. He entered, as it were, into the great web of humanity. He was born in our line. You could read that in the Gospels. How it goes through Adam, etc. And then it, go, and it gets to Christ. He was actually a human. Though 100% God. Yes. He, God became flesh that's a mystery that's the mystery of God that he that the creator became the creature to bring them redemption did anybody ask him to do that did anybody ask Jesus to die on the cross and suffer for all their sins did anybody ask him to do that no so what that means, Elder Vic, is that before we could choose, before we could believe, before we could confess, before we could ask, before we could, before we were born, Jesus did something for us. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. We didn't ask Him to do it, but He did it. 
It is so easy to ask for forgiveness to someone who you know has already forgiven you. Amen. Yes. You commit a sin, he already died for that. All you got to do is tell him about it. And say, Lord, give me a clean heart so that I don't do that anymore. Jesus lived out the perfect version of my life. So live out thy life within me, oh Jesus, King of kings. He did something for me. If he, Adam, when he sinned, well, he lost the whole thing. And so because of him, we were all lost. But Jesus became the second Adam. Entering into the great web of humanity to produce a, a new reproductive line whereby we may all be born again. Hallelujah. The question is not how are you born? The question is, are you born again? You see, when you're born again, you have a new mind. You have new motives, a new ambition. You're just different. You're not the same anymore. And that's because of the man Christ Jesus. When you just take time throughout your day to think about the goodness of God. Remember that it's not just for you, but it's for people that don't even care. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26 that he became us. You know what that means, that he became us? That involves too many people. Make it personal. If he became us and he didn't become you, is that text true? No. So if he became us, necessarily it involves you. So you could read that text and understand it to be that he became me. Don't take it too far now, because the gospel is not that we become God. No, the gospel is that God became us. That means he entered into your personal experience. That nobody understands. You can say it to your friends, but they don't get it. They never will. They cannot. But Jesus can. He entered into your personal experience. When you burn, he burns. When you hurt, he hurts. When you cry, he cries. Why? Because he became you. That young boy that was abused. Christ knows. Jesus knows all about our troubles. He will guide. Till the day is done. Yes. There's not a friend like the holy Jesus. No, not one. <laughs> no, not one. Not one. Yes. God. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is all the world to me. Why do we continue to choose sin after Jesus has done all of that for us? We break his heart every time, crucify him afresh. Is there any room in your heart for Jesus today? As we're saying, names are significant. What's the name of this church? Midnight Cry. Midnight Cry. Midnight Cry. You didn't choose your name. You didn't choose your name. By the end of this message, you're going to understand something. But this name that you have, it's a massive deal. Mm. Mm. I wish I understood what I just said right now. Mm. Mm. I just know that it's true, but I won't claim to understand it all. All I know is that that name is a big deal. You have a big responsibility. Yes, yeah, so true. Midnight cry. Yeah. 
Yes, Lord. You remember in uh, the parable of the ten virgins, mm -hmm. and there were five. All, all ten were asleep. Mm -hmm. Then after that, five awakened. Right. All, all, all right. Pardon me. All awakened. Five only had five had uh, 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 extra oil. Mm -hmm. where, where I actually want to get to is this. How did they wake up? At midnight there was a crime. At midnight there was a crime. Let me ask you another question. Uh, who, who, who do the ten virgins represent? The, 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 represents the church. Any other answer? The ten virgins. Who do they represent? I, I like that answer. The state of the church. Hmm. I like that answer. Because let's go with the answer that it represents the church. Let's go with that answer. It represents the church. Who gave the cry? Hmm. If the ten versions represent the church, who gave, who gave the cry? Did the cry come from within the ten virgins? No. no. So if the ten versions represent the church, then what you are saying is that the ten virgins did not give the cry. In other words, the cry did not come from the church. Mm -hmm. So I want you to follow this thing. The ten virgins represent the condition of the church. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. But if we are to see it to represent the church, well then what it would be, we would say, we, we would understand it to mean that there was someone that wasn't a part, maybe let's say, of the organization. Maybe there wasn't someone who was a part of the of the church, however one may define church, but someone from outside of that group gave a cry and they finally woke up. Those people, they're called the procession. They are watchmen that were watching for the bridegroom's coming and they saw the bridegroom coming. They had the more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto they did well to fall as unto a light. They had the more sure word of prophecy. They could see the bridegroom was coming. And they said, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And then the church finally woke up. Only five had the extra oil. The wise. And then they, if you read in Christ's object lesson, chapter 29, the last chapter... The five joined the procession. Those five, they joined the people that were saying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. So as we were speaking earlier, some were saying, like, if we're in a church, some people don't. Some people may say, why should I stay at this church if this is going on or whatnot? However the Lord calls and leads you to go, you follow what he has to say. Yes. But here in this parable, what I also see is that he is calling for those who are awake to wake up the sleeping church and let them know behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him some will have the extra oil and they will follow on to know the lord others will remain foolish and will continue with singing swinging dancing and all the other stuff that god says is not what he requires god is calling for us to wake up his sleeping church yes. by giving the midnight cry. And right now, we are living in a window of opportunity to get that done. Yes. I'm going to prove that to you. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Lamentations chapter 2. Lamentations chapter 2. Right before we go there, as you're turning there, we'll have another word of prayer. Amen. So again, if you can assume a reverent position with me, I'll bow my head. If you can bow your heads, we will pray. Our Father, our God in heaven, as we open your word now, we ask for your Holy Spirit to fall upon us in a large measure. Cleanse us of all of our sins and our unrighteousness, that your word of truth may shine forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 19. The Bible says in Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 19. Arise, cry out in the night. In the beginning of the watches. I want to make sure we're all there. Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 19. Right near the book of Jeremiah. 
And not too far from the book of Isaiah, Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 19. Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 19. When we're there, let's say amen. Amen. All right. Uh, so arise, shine. Arise, pardon me, I was just thinking of Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, cry out in the night. In the when? In the night. In the night. In the beginning of the watches, pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up thy hands toward him for the life of the young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street. We are to arise and cry out in the night in the beginning of the watches. We're going to be studying the watches. In our prior study, we saw that every member of the 144,000, they will be told the day and the hour of Jesus' coming. Mm -hmm. The reason as to why they will know the day and the hour of Jesus' coming is because they will hear the voice of God. Right? They will hear the voice of God. The other reason why they will know, other than hearing the voice of God, we read in Revelation in chapter 3 that they were watching. And because they were watching, Christ could not come upon them as a thief in the night. Because they were watching, they could hear, that they could know the day and the hour. So they were watching. Now, if we are watchmen, we are to understand the watches of the night and see how it applies to us as God's last day people. So we are studying this because we want to have the mindset of the 144,000. These people will have the highest experience with God than any previous generation. Yes. Any previous generation. Yes. Even higher than Elijah, and he's in heaven. Even higher than Moses, and he's in heaven. Even higher than Enoch, and he's in heaven. Even higher than all of those individuals. Why do I say that? Because not only do they have the message that brings salvation, they also have the message that brings translation but it's more than just salvation it's more than just experiencing translation this is about the vindication yes. of the character Hallelujah. of God. God is going to have a final generation Amen. that will perfectly vindicate his character. Amen. They will prove that God is love. Amen. And that's what this is all about. Yes. You see, the great controversy in heaven was based upon the misapprehension of the character of God. Yes. The enemy of all souls was misrepresenting the character of God. Lucifer, the bearer of light, became the bearer of lies concerning the character of God. And people taking in the lies about God became different. Those angels became different. They were no longer angels, but they became demons. Why? Because they had a wrong picture of God in their mind. If you are an angel, if you have the wrong picture of God in your mind, you become a demon. Yes, that's right. That's right. Sin. You see, the Bible says, we're told, not in the Bible, but um, the Bible does show this, that the law of God is the transcript of his character. Yes. If we don't know the law of God, the character of God, we don't even know when we're in sin. We don't even realize that we're changing. You look at Cain, first he was a loving brother to Abel. They were good. But then Cain was disobeying God. And God said, look, if you do the right thing, then you'll be all right. But sin lies at the door. Cain still wanted to go his own way, do his own thing. And as he continued his own way, God didn't accept his, 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 his sacrifice. I mean, he didn't really, it wasn't really a sacrifice. It was the fruits of his labor. Then he became angry. And his brother that he used to love, he saw him as an enemy that he must kill. First a loving brother, and now because of, his, of, his, of the breakdown in his relationship with God, he became a murderer. You see, the breakdown in our relationships are very closely connected to our relationship with God. How is your relationship with God? The quality of our life is closely connected with the quality of our relationships. Amen. How is your relationship with God? So as I was saying, the that, that, that's what that's what that's what that's. I mean, Lucifer's story is so sad because he, he was he was the um, he was the, the cherub, yeah, the anointed cherub. The, the, he was he was the number one covering cherub. 
He was the maestro, right? Um, uh, yeah, pipes, light the Bible bearer. says. Light bearer, music, that was, that was his thing. He would introduce God when he came before, before, before the entire world. You see, Jesus was the archangel Michael. Amen? He is the archangel Michael. Uh, he's not a created angel. He's not a created angel. Amen. Amen. Jesus is not created. Jesus is not created. Amen. He is an angel, but he is not created. Amen. When I say angel, the word angel simply means agelos, which is a messenger. Jesus is not just the messenger of God. He is the message Amen. of God. You understand? Amen. The Bible says that in the beginning was the word, word and the word was God, and the word was with God. God. All right? So, that, so Jesus is the word of God. That word, word, is the Greek word logos, yes. which is where we get our English word logic from. Jesus is the logic, the thinking, the mental faculties of God. He's God's idea for you and for me. Mm. All right. And so Jesus, being in eternity with God, the kind of glory of God, when he came to meet the angels, well, he has to meet us where we are. Yes. Okay, angels can't understand infinity. They can't understand eternity. They dwell in the space-time continuum just like you and like me. We don't know the, physica, the physics of angels, but we know that they dwell in the space-time continuum. And so Christ would meet them as the archangel Michael. And this is just my imagination now. I like to imagine a little bit and not add to the word of God. But just imagine that Jesus, archangel Michael, would come out of the glory of God. And then Lucifer would see him come out and would cry out, who is like God? That's what Michael means. It means who is like God? And all the angels would probably respond, there is none like him. This is just my imagination. But then sadly, the bearer of light, he said, I don't want to bear the light. I want to be the source. The Bible says that there was war in heaven. And God so generously, so kindly, he didn't get into a shouting match with Lucifer, but he created a brand new creature, hmm. namely humanity. Yes. And he said, let us make man in our image. image. And after our own likeness, he did that because there was a misrepresentation of his image and he created humanity to give the correct representation of the kind of person that he is. Sadly, we fell into sin, though. But we are in the generation of what? Restoration. restoration. God wants to restore his Amen. image Amen. in us. Amen. Now, I want to come closer to us now. In the time that we're living in. We are to be watchmen, shining this light of truth to the whole entire world. In Revelation chapter 18, it talks about another angel coming down from heaven having great power. And the Bible says the earth was lightened with his glory. That's the glory of Jesus. Yeah, that angel coming from heaven, that represents the most holy place experience of Christ and his people. Where is Jesus right now? In the most holy place. So any light that we are bringing is not coming from the holy place. It's coming from the most holy place to shine upon this world. Are you having a most holy place experience with Jesus today? Because that is the light. And that is the light that needs to shine upon this entire world. So we've read about the watchmen. They have this light. That's how they're able to see that the bridegroom is coming and that we need to go out and meet him. Let's read a little bit here. In Isaiah 21 and verse 6, the Bible says, For thus saith the Lord, for, for thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go set watchmen, let him declare what he yes. sees. You know, they used to call prophets seers, yes. right? Yes. Right, right? So, 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 so that means that if we are watchmen, we are to be as seers. We need to be studying prophecy. Amen. We need to be studying prophecy. Mm -hmm. what, is the, what, what is the watchman asked? Well, the burden of Duma, Isaiah 21, 11. He calleth to me out of seer. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? What is going on tonight? What is going on tonight? Let's turn our Bibles to the book of John. Let me see here. 
John. Let's go to John and chapter 11. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Now, I want you to keep your, your finger on John chapter 11. I want you to keep that there, and we're going to read this text up here. But I want you to just have that in advance, because we're going to see that in a moment. As we're studying the watches here, in Luke chapter 12, verse 37, the Bible says, Blessed, what? Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serving. So when God comes, then how should he find us? Watching. He should find us watching. The 144,000 will be found watching. watching. So that means they will understand the watches. So we're going to understand this thing. We're going to understand this thing. Let me see what's the next slide here. Those who watch for the Lord's coming are not waiting in idle expectancy. The expectation of Christ's coming is to make men fear the Lord and fear his judgments upon transgression. It is, it is to awaken them to the great sin of rejecting his offers of mercy. Those who are watching for the Lord are purifying their souls by what? Obedience, Obedience to the truth. This is key. With Vigilant watching. They combine earnest working. So we're not just watching, but we're also working. Because they know that the Lord is at the door. Their zeal is quickened to cooperate with the divine intelligences in working for the salvation of souls. They're working for the salvation of souls. These are the faithful and wise servants who give the Lord's household the portion of meat in due season. They are declaring the truth that is now specially applicable as Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and Moses each declare the truth for his time. So will Christ's servants now give the special warning for their generation. generation. We are to give a special warning for this generation. Different periods in history. This is Great Controversy, page 608, paragraph 1. Different periods in the history of the church have each been marked by the development of some special truth. Special truth. Adapted to the necessities of God's people at that time. Every new truth has made its way against hatred and opposition. Those who were blessed with its light were tempted and tried. The Lord gives a special truth for the people in an emergency. Who dared to refuse to publish it? He commands his servants to present the last invitation of mercy to the world. They cannot remain silent. We read that in Isaiah chapter 62 earlier today. They cannot remain silent except at the peril of their souls. Christ's ambassadors have nothing to do with consequences. They must perform their duty and leave the results with God. It is none of my business how people respond to the message that God has given me to give. I must Amen. and I will give it. Amen. Amen. Say that again. It doesn't matter how people will treat me. It doesn't matter how people will respond. The message that God has given must be given. You see, when we started this ministry called Last Ray Ministries back in 2014, I didn't choose the name. I came across it in the book Christ's Object Lesson on page 415 in paragraph 5. And it says that the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to this world revelation is the revelation God. of his character of love. That, that's the last one. There's no other message after that. That's right. It's the last right. one. Amen. And so I have to leave all of the results with God, God saints. And you're going to see how this is interconnected with your name. Midnight cry. Yeah. Oh, if only I could understand the depth of it myself. We are to leave the consequences with God. Now we're in John chapter 11. Do you have that? John chapter 11. We're going to break down the watches very, very shortly. We're in John chapter 11, reading from verse 9. I want you to see something that Jesus said there as we're building this. John chapter 11, verse 9 and verse 10. John 11, verse 9 and verse 10. The Bible says, Jesus answered... Are there not 12 hours in the day? 
If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Okay? So here, Jesus is simply pointing out that there are 12 hours in the day. That's really what I want to highlight. The fact that there are 12 hours in the day. 12 hours in the day, necessarily 12 hours in the day. The night. All right. Let's see. What do we have here? Okay. Before we get to that, before we get to that, we already established that the Bible teaches about the generations. That there are how many years makes one generation? Forty. Forty years. And now, how many generations complete a cycle? Four. Four generations complete one cycle. So God said that judgment will fall upon which generations? Third and, fourth. Third and fourth generations. Okay. So the Bible establishes that one generation equals 40 years. Now when Christ spoke of the final generation in Mark chapter 13, which we read earlier today, he also spoke about the watches of the night. The two are not separate thoughts. The generations and the watches of the night, they are not separate thoughts, but they are connected. The Adventist pioneers, they understood this. But let's again take a moment to see this in Mark chapter 13. So let's go back to Mark chapter 13, and we'll read again verse 34 and verse 35. Verse 34 and verse 35 of Mark chapter 13. 13. Mark chapter 13, verse 34 and verse 35. If we're there, let's say amen. 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 <clears throat> All right. And we'll even read up to verse 37 because it's short enough. The Bible says, For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say, I say, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. So here Christ points out the four watches of the night. He points out the four watches of the night. Now, as Christ said in John chapter 11, there are 12 hours of the day. Now, 12 hours of, because there are 12 hours in the day, there are also 12 hours in the night. And these four watches of the night, right, they're evenly divided among the 12 hours in the night. So when do the watches begin? At what time do the watches begin is a question that may come up. It begins at 6 p.m. The evening watch begins at 6 p.m. And it ends at 9 p.m. They're each in three-hour intervals. Now, as Elder Vic had pointed out, way earlier in the past, they used to have three watches in the night. Still a 12-hour period, but broken out into three. Broken out into three. And then they changed it to four watches in the night. In the time of Christ, there were four watches, as Christ pointed out. So each are evenly divided, three hours each. Midnight is from 9 to 12 p.m. The cock crowing watch is from 12 to 3 a.m. And the morning watch is from 3 to 6 a.m. And we came to understand that Christ was uh, betrayed at the, in the midnight watch, mm -hmm. probably near the end of the midnight, midnight watch necessarily, because after Peter betrayed him, then the cock crowed. Mm -hmm. So that was the start of the third watch. That is the cock crowing watch. Now Christ does not take it lightly that we understand these watches because he said as I say unto all, I say unto you watch. watch. And so we need to be sure that we are watching. Now what I want you to understand here is that the way that the watches fit into the generations is that the watches are evenly distributed within the generations. Meaning that each watch in the, in the generation equals 10 years. 
follow me along, follow along with me, and, I'm, and, and we're going to build this thing properly. Each watch, in the same way as it's evenly divided in the night, in the 12-hour night, is the same way that each watch is evenly divided in a 40-year generation. So each watch equals 10 years. Each watch equals 10 years. So yeah, so I have this here pointed out here. Four watches in the night. In the same way as there are four watches in the night, there are four watches in a generation. Since the watches are of equal duration, each watch must be 40 divided by 4, which is 10 years long. Each watch is 10 years long. They're 10 years long. We saw this earlier. The generations of Seventh-day Adventism. The generations of Seventh-day Adventism. So, in Generation 1, from 1844 to 1884, we have within there the four watches of the night. Mm -hmm. In the second generation, you have the four watches of the night. Third, same thing, same thing. Same thing for our generation of restoration. The four watches of the night are in each generation. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, I want us to see this for ourselves. The pioneers understood this. Sister White understood this. So earlier we were numbering our days, now we're zeroing in a bit closer to where we are today. Because we, we know what generation we're in. What is the name of this generation? Restoration. The generation of restoration. Now we need to figure out which watch are we living in in this generation. We're going to see that even now. But let's first make sure that the pioneers, Sister White, Spirit of Prophecy, is aligned with us. And we're going to read something from Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2, page 192. Is everybody clear so far on the generations and the watches? Is there any question? I want to be sure that we're all following together. Is everybody clear on, on this so far? Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? Any question? Because I don't mind taking a question. We're good. Amen. Okay, excellent. Good. So, the waiting ones were represented to me as looking upward. They were encouraging one another by repeating these words. Let's read it together. The first and second watches are past. We are in the third watch, waiting and watching for the master's return. There remains but a little period of watching now. I saw some becoming weary. Their eyes were directed downward, and they were engrossed with earthly things, and were unfaithful in watching. They were saying, in the first watch, we expected our master, but were disappointed. Wait a minute, wait a minute. She said, in the which watch? In the first watch, we were what? Disappointed. We, we expected our master, but were disappointed. So what is she referencing here? The great disappointment. So she's saying that the first watch, in the first watch, was also the great disappointment. So the great disappointment was the first watch. Is this what she's saying, yes or no? Yes. That's exactly what she's saying. I mean, that's what I see over here. And somebody can say, wait, you just copied and pasted this. Maybe you made this up. No, no, you could go on the app. If you have your phone or your iPad, you can read it for yourself, and you can see it for yourself. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2, page 192, Paragraph 1. In the first watch, we expected our master, but were disappointed. We thought surely he would come in the second watch, but that passed, and he came not. We may be again disappointed. We, may, we need not be so particular. He may not come in the following watch. We are in the third watch, and now we think it best to lay up our treasure on earth that we may be secure against want. Many were, this is what people were saying, many were sleeping, stupefied with the cares of this life and allured by the deceitfulness of riches from their waiting, watching position. So what watch were they in when this was written? The third watch. They were in the third watch. Let's keep on reading. I saw that watch after watch was in the past. Because of this, should there be a lack of vigilance? Oh, no. There is the greater necessity of unceasing, of unceasing watchfulness. For now the moments are fewer than before the passing of the first watch. The moments are shorter now. 
Now the period of waiting is necessarily shorter than at first. If we watched with unabated vigilance, then how much more need of double watchfulness in the second watch? The passing of the second watch has brought us to the third, and now it is inexcusable to abate our watchfulness. The third watch calls for threefold earnestness. Amen. So in other words, what she's saying is that the long the the longer it takes for Christ to return, the more intense should be our watching, yes. mm -hmm. our watchfulness. And we're not just to watch, but we are to pray, and we are to work as well. Amen. And we're to work as well. Now, what watch were they in when Sister White wrote this? Sure. So Sister White, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2, page 193, Paragraph 1, when she wrote this, she wrote this when they were in the third watch. She said when we were in the first watch, we were disappointed. So if we're to look over here, the uh, first watch began 1844. That's when they were disappointed. So that's the first watch. Now she's saying we are right now in the third watch. When she wrote that, she was in the third watch. So which, around which year must that testimony have been written? Cochran. Cochran. So between 1864 to 1874, that testimony must have been written. True or false? True. True, because, because she said we are in the third watch. So, okay, Sister White, if you're in the third watch, then that means that what you wrote must have been written between 1864 to 1874. So if you are to go back in Testimonies Volume 2 to see the beginnings, because it actually gives you the date of when it was written, you will see that it was written in the third watch, between 1864 to 1874. And here it is, 1868. 1868. She understood the watch that she was living in. If she was still, if, if Christ had returned then, then she would be part of the 140 and 4,000. And we have testimonies where she talks about that, don't we? All right. So here we see very, very clearly from the spirit of prophecy the truth concerning the watches, the timing of the watches, and that the pioneers and those of old, they knew it as well. Because they said, we saw what they said. They said, we are in the third, we, we are in the third watch. We are in the third watch, and now we think it best to lay up treasures on earth that we may be secure of, against one. So even if they knew the watch that they were living in, some people were still saying, well, let's just make ourselves comfortable. It's the third watch. Let's just, let's just relax. Just because you know the watches, that doesn't mean you're going to be saved. Some people, some of them were still saying, and knowing the watch is saying, it's the third watch, let's just, let's just hang out. No, we need threefold earnestness. Threefold earnestness. So, now that we know, and we see the strength of this thing, well, which watch are we in? Which watch are we in? Let's see here. Hold on a minute. Which watch are we in? Are we in the evening watch? No. No, that, because that's from 2004 to 2014. We are in the midnight watch. 2014 to 2024. We're in the generation of restoration, which began in 2004 and ends in 2044. And when we put the watches within this generation of restoration, we find ourselves in midnight. We are right now living in the midnight watch. The name Midnight Cry, SDA, is, you didn't choose that name. You have that name for such a time as this. We are right now living in the midnight watch. We are living in a window of opportunity to hasten the second coming of Jesus. Christ can come in this midnight watch. Yes, sir. Yes. I'm going to say that again. Mm -hmm. Christ can come in this midnight watch. Yes, sir. Do you not love the idea that Jesus could come in this midnight watch? Yes. The Bible speaks of those who love the thought of his appearing. Do you love the thought that Jesus could come in this midnight watch? Yeah. Saints of God, he can. He can. And, and if we go to the book of Luke, chapter, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. 
And I want you to see something there in the book of Luke chapter 12, and we're coming here to a close. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, I want us to consider what we are to do, being that we understand that we're living in the midnight watch. Luke chapter 12, we're going to read from verse 35. Verse 35 to verse 40. The Bible says, if we're there, let's say amen. Luke chapter 12. Amen. amen. The Bible says, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Your lights doing what? Burning. burning. Your lights need to be burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. And that, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Now, 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 look at verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. watching. Do we now know the watch that we are living in according to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? Yes. Yes. So we can be blessed. We can be blessed. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Now look with me at verse 38. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. Who said that? Jesus said that. He said, and if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. I did not say those words. So no, nobody go around saying, Brother Michael said that Jesus is going to come in this watch or he's going to come in the next watch. I am just reading to you what Jesus said. He said, if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them, so blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour that ye think not. If he comes in the second or in the third watch. Why didn't he say if he comes in the first, second, or third, or fourth watch? Why, why didn't he mention the other watches? I don't have an answer other than that question. Why didn't he say the first or the fourth watch? Why is he only mentioning the second or the third? These are just, yes, yes. I think the closing of probation is happening while you say all of this. So he's looking at us getting the work done, where we are going mm. right now, mm. trying to finish the work. Mm. That is what the Lord is looking at. Mm. And then that brings the other provision. Mm. If you are waiting here, mm. not going anywhere, then we can be, we can have a good time and we eat a lot of food and that kind of thing. But you say, let them work. Because mm. probation is literally closing. Mm. Mm. So that's what I am seeing. Okay. It's closing. Mm. And we don't have weeks mm. and mm. months to play with. Mm. It is really serious closing probation. Lord, teach us to number our days so that we can apply our hearts to wisdom. None of us have any idea as to when our probation will close. What we know is that the time that we're living in right now, we must make a decision to choose this day who we will serve. Now is decision time to choose on which side of the controversy we will be found in the second or the third watch Christ could come and we his servants can be blessed let me uh, point this out here and at midnight there was a cry because we're right now in which watch midnight, midnight. Yeah. let's see in the Bible what happens at midnight if we're living in midnight then we should know from the Bible what happens in midnight the cry. at midnight there's a cry there's a cry made behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him there's also another cry which is behold your God. Behold your God. You read that in the book Christ's Object Lesson there. In the last chapter, it says, Behold the bridegroom cometh, but we who are living in these last moments before Christ comes. Because the midnight cry was given 
It was given and it has to continue to be given. And the midnight cry will be joined by the loud, loud cry, Amen. which is behold your God. God, the truth about our God. Amen. That's what happens at midnight. What else happens at midnight? In the book of Job, it says, in a moment shall they die and the people shall be troubled at midnight. trouble comes at midnight. midnight. There's a quote in the in, in the great controversy about what happens at midnight. It's not just trouble that comes at midnight, but something else happens at midnight. Oh, that's right. Deliverance comes at midnight. We can read of the story in the book of Exodus. The Bible says, and it came to pass that at midnight, the Lord smote all the firstborn of the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and his, all his servants and all the Egyptians and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Pharaoh, said, Pharaoh let the people go. There was deliverance at midnight. midnight. Now, by the way, this cry, not every cry that's at midnight is a true midnight cry. <laughs> not every cry at midnight is a true midnight cry. Because this cry right over here is not a cry of deliverance, but this is a cry of despair. Mm -hmm. Probation was closed, so all they could do is, all there could be was weeping. And gnashing of teeth. Make sure that your cry counts. Amen. Make sure that your cry counts. Amen. At midnight, I will rise to give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgments. Midnight is a time of thankfulness to God. As the children's story was given today, thankfulness. I didn't plan this, saints. But at midnight, midnight cry SDA is a time of thankfulness for the revelations that God has given unto us. Amen. This is the last thing that we'll read and then we're done here. Last thing we'll read, oh no, well, yeah, basically. This is from the book of Judges, we were just looking at that with Elder Vic a minute ago. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. The middle watch is the midnight watch. Now, at that time, I believe there were three watches in the night, right? But that middle watch, that middle watch, midnight was in there necessarily because midnight, mid is short for middle. Okay. Mm -hmm. So at the midnight watch, what happened? In the, uh, in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch, and there blew the trumpet. We need to give the trumpet a certain sound. Mm -hmm. And they blew the trumpets and break the pictures that were in their hand we have this treasure in earthen vessels we need to be broken upon the rock christ jesus if we're going to do this work they gave the trumpet a certain sound and break the pictures that were in their hands and the how many companies three and the three companies three angels message the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hand and the trumpets in their right hand to blow with all. And they did what? Cried. They cried. When did they cry? At midnight. So there we see the midnight cry. There we see the midnight cry. They cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. This is history but it is also our story this is the story that we could have in this midnight watch we close here those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people behold your god the last rays of merciful light the last message of mercy to be given to the world is the revelation of his character of love has your heart been filled with the love of god as it is in jesus do you want for your heart to be filled with the truth as it is in Jesus in this watch? Jesus has one intention for you right now. And that is to cleanse you of all of your sin and to fill you with his righteousness and love. He wants to heal your and my hearts. He wants to make us anew. He wants us to be new creatures in him. He wants to heal our homes, heal our minds, heal us from all of our sicknesses and diseases. 
He wants us to love one another. You know, love creates love for the unworthy. Hmm. It creates forgiveness for the unforgivable. Love is not something you deserve. It's just something that you get. It's just something that you get from God. It's not just something that comes to you, but rather through you to others. Do you love your enemies? Hmm. Remember how he said in the beginning of the message that, that Jesus became us? Mm -hmm. He also became the people that have positioned themselves against us. As much as ye have done unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. How can that be so? Because he became the least of your and my brethren. How do we treat the least among us? Do we shine this light to them? It's not just talking about prophecy. It's, it's shining the light of truth, of love, of healing love that actually changes people. It's my prayer. It is my prayer that we see that this is the time where we can have this highest experience with Jesus. Amen. He is available for you. Will you let him in your heart today? Will you let Jesus into your heart today? If you will, just bow your heads with me. Or if you can stand and bow your heads so that we could pray to our Father in heaven that he may restore us. Now, God may be speaking in your heart right now, and you see, this is the time where I want to choose Him. This is the time where I don't want to be wishy-washy with God. I actually want Him to make me new. I want to be a watchman who is looking for the coming of Jesus. I want my family to be saved. I want my heart to be healed. I don't even know what I need. All I know is I need Jesus. If that is you, then I want to invite you to come forward. If that is you, then I want to invite you to come forward. If you're saying, I want to be a part of the 140 and 4,000. I realize the sacrifice that Christ, actually I don't realize the sacrifice that Christ is calling for, but he made a sacrifice for me. I didn't ask him to do it. And I just want to reflect what he's done for me. I want to give all because he gave all to me. If that's you, then let's press together. Let's press together. Let's press together. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Our Father, our God in heaven, we haven't chosen you, but it's you that has chosen us. We haven't even chosen our names, but it's been given to us by our parents. We haven't even chosen our name as a church, but, but, but it's you who has brought the idea and has brought it to fruition. And we realize that name represents character. The character of the work that you have called for us to do. Lucifer had a character to be a light bearer. Sadly, he became the bearer of, light, the bearer of lies. Jesus, that name being Jehovah is salvation. He he, he did just that. He brought us salvation. Emmanuel, being God with us, he was indeed with us, even personally, entering into our experience, living out the perfect version of our life, and God, we're thankful for that. We would that his life, he who is the light of life, would live out his life in us and shine that light throughout the whole world. As we proclaim the midnight cry that would swell into the loud cry, we want our lives, O oh God, to speak of your goodness. Your word says that the heaven declare your glory, and the firmament declares your good works. Father, we would do the same. We would that when people see your light through us, that they may glorify you and the good work that you have done in us, of creating in us a clean heart and restoring in us a right spirit. We recognize ourselves to be this generation of restoration. Lord, I ask that for every individual in this room right now, Lord, that you may enter and remain in their hearts in a very special way. That you may not allow them to keep silent of your goodness in their life. 
that when others see and hear about your goodness in their life, that they may be brought closer to you. Lord, fill this church with your presence, with your goodness, and with your Holy Spirit. Pour upon them your early and even your latter rain. Ripen them that they may have the full corn in the ear, God. That they may be harvest ready for Jesus to come and to claim them as his own. Father, dwell with the leadership and enrich them with your love. And God, that this place may be a place of light, a place where your cry, your truth, would always be proclaimed as they seek to hasten the second coming of Jesus. Bless us, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.